Good, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pascarello, for extending this um, invitation. It is indeed a, an honor. I'm humbled by it. And um, it's always good to be back on this, these sacred grounds, a place that I hold so dear, not only from my time matriculating here, but we have a, a child here as well who is uh, a student athlete at Sanford. And we actually have two because Corey Savage is our son-in-law, and uh, we thank God for, for him. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not honor and just acknowledge the presence of my dean, uh, Dean Doug Sweeney. It is indeed an honor just to be in his presence, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, probably more than anything, I'm thankful for you, Dr. Sterling, Dr. Webster, it's so good to see you. Dr. Webster and I are dear friends. We went to Ghana, spent two weeks together, and so uh, it's always such a pleasure to see uh, my friend and brother, Dr. Doug Webster. It's all, perhaps more than anything, it's a delight to be here with you. One of my passions is to serve alongside, to pour into, and to learn from uh, students, especially students at this prestigious institution. So uh, I'm glad today to do what I love doing, and that is teach preaching. And it's my hope that both of us, you and I, will be enriched and empowered after this presentation. I mentioned that I have a son here at Sanford, uh, Titus. Titus is quite the athlete. Uh, there is a time in his life that is forever etched in my memory. I often use it as a preaching prop, and, but it speaks to our experiences with the Holy Spirit, our helper. Titus, when he was a lad of a boy, couldn't have been any more than six or seven years old, played baseball, and we were at the park one day. We were headed to the park. And his mother, my wife, says to him and his younger brother, you all need to eat before we get to the park because I will not be buying anything at the concession stand. The concession stand can get pricey, be pricey. So lo and behold, we spend the bulk of the day there uh, and with, without fail, on our way back to the car, Titus says, I'm hungry and I want something to drink. His mother, true to her word, she said, I told you I wasn't buying anything. We're, we're going go to we're gonna go home and we're going to eat. We get in the car and Titus has a grimace on his face. He's upset. He's almost, he's this far from a temper tantrum. And so I said, Titus, why don't you want to eat when you get home? He said, what do we have at home? I said, we have hamburger helper at home. And he puffed and he gestures. And I said, what's wrong? You don't like hamburger helper? And he said, I like the hamburger, but I don't like the helper. <laughs> so I thought about that, and I, I think that sometimes preaching can be like that. We like the hamburger, the stuff that we like, but sometimes the helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, we have a taste aversion to him. This is to suggest that many times in our preaching, we feel the audacity to go at it alone. There is a temptation many times in all of us that reeks of a self-sufficiency. This spirit that in the preaching moment, we will rely on our homiletical muscle memory. That is to suggest that many of us, if we are preaching and have a few years in this um, ministry, we rely on our memory to do what we do every week, in and out, rather ten, than to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. 
If that is not enough, if we are not relying on the homiletical muscle memory, many times we rely on uh, amusement and entertainment. In the African-American preaching tradition, too many preachers substitute the hard work of study for a song. So they feel as if they can sing their way through. On the other end of that spectrum, many of us rely on our intellectual prowess. So from the pulpit, we leverage intellectual and scholarly rhetoric with this deception that if the people do not connect to the sermon, it's their lack of intellectual maturity not my lack of preparation. But preaching, brothers and sisters, is what James Forbes called in his book, The Holy Spirit and Preaching. It compels us to enter into contract with the Holy Spirit. And so, need I say that you and I, no matter how long we've been at it, we will fail miserably without the presence of the Holy Spirit. So now we've heard a lot about the number of hours one must invest into sermon preparation. Uh, some have said, you know, you need a minute, uh, an hour for every minute that you're gonna put into the sermon. Recently I refreshed myself with one of my favorite uh, homileticians, Haddon Robinson's book, uh, Biblical Preaching. But the follow-up book from Biblical Preaching is his book entitled Biblical Sermon, B Biblical Sermons. In this book, Haddon Robinson takes 12 preachers, and each preacher submits a sermon, commentary, and then there's an interview. And the first question in the interview is, how much time do you invest in sermon preparation? The least amount of time from the 12 is about eight hours. One of the preachers uh, comments that he spends no less than 20 hours a week in sermon preparation. Now, I want to stick a pen right there to say, say this, that there, just as there is no substitute from our dependency on the Holy Spirit, there is no excuse for us neglecting the sweat and the labor of exegetical work. We must put in the work if our sermons are going to be effective and transformative. But let's be honest. How many of us really put 20 hours into sermon prep? I'm very busy. Uh, I have a, a gamut of things to do. And some of them relate around my, my work, my family, uh, my profession. And as hard as I try, sometimes I just cannot get in 20 hours, or let alone the time that I would like to put into it. This is all the more reason why we must rely on the Holy Spirit. So when I got the invitation from Dr. Pascarello, one of the, the things he wanted us to talk about was to encourage uh, you, the students, how working pastors manage their time during uh, the responsibility of preaching in week in and week out. So I'm gonna do that. So what I'm gonna do is two things. I'm going to offer some bits of wisdom in what you can do, one thing you can do when the demands of work, family, Dr. Ross and Dr. Padilla and Dr. Sterling and Dr. Pascarello all together uh, converge upon you because you can hardly come to them and say, hey, Dr. Pascarello, I have to preach Sunday or I had to preach Sunday, so uh, I didn't get enough time to, to study for your test, right? That won't fly. So there, there are things that I deem sacred but also practical that we can do. And one of the things is we preach uh, uh, sermons that we've preached before. Uh, it is my conviction that 
if you preached it once, it should, you should be able to preach it again. If you feel that you cannot preach it again, now there are some outliers, right? That probably it may not should have been preached the first time. So I want to I wanna talk to you about what I did with Joshua chapter 4 because I preached Joshua chapter 4. In fact, the first time I preached Joshua chapter 4 was in Dr. Smith's class as a student here at Beeson Divinity School. Since that time, I probably preached Joshua chapter 4 about three or four times. The most recent time that I've preached Joshua 4 is in, in, is in the form of what I call the social crisis sermon. So my research is in social crisis preaching. So I wrote a dissertation about uh, an, an analysis of prophetic radicalism in the social crisis preaching of Kelly Miller Smith. So I want to talk about the social crisis sermon, what we're doing there, but also while at the same time I offer you some wisdom. Uh, and one of the things that you can do when you have to preach or feel led to preach a sermon that you've preached before. I don't think there's a whole lot that's been shared about that. I think there, there's this assumption that, hey, if you've preached it one time, hey, regurgitate it. But what if the setting is different? What if the audience is different? There have been times that I have had a busy week and I knew that I need to preach something that I've probably preached before, but just any old sermon that you've preached before just won't do. So it's not like I can uh, open up my folder on my MacBook Pro that says sermon and say, okay, any, many, mighty, mo, you're it. It just doesn't work like that. There has to be a connection, not only with the sermon, the preacher, and the people, but I do believe that there has to be some unction of the Holy Spirit. So I want to talk about that today. So um, these um, text selection. So I want to talk a little bit about text selection because uh, when you've done this week in and week out, uh, you will have to preach something you've preached before. So I've been doing this for 26 years, and I have a, a, a pretty good reservoir of preaching. But um, there's hardly an occasion that I don't have a sermon for. Uh, this helps, but it doesn't help completely for reasons that I just mentioned. When the setting is different, the timing, the occasion, the audience is different, you know, so this is where the investing oneself in prayer is, is essential and unparalleled because through prayer, one, one receives inspiration, illumination, uh, much of the anxiety and dread associated with prayer, the prayer process when you've had a busy week is removed by the experience of prayer and partnership with the Holy Spirit. So even in, if you're preaching something you've preached before, we need the guidance and the help of the Holy Spirit. So when I'm selecting a, a passage or, or a text, uh, that is guided through prayer. Of course, con congregational needs, uh, if you're in a sermon series that has a lot to do with the, the text that we select, holidays, those of you who, whose church is a part of a liturgical tradition, uh, all of these things play into how texts are selected. For me, once the text is selected and settled on, and even if it's something that I preached before, I want to re-read re that passage over and over again. Dr. Smith suggests 50 times, but you know, and he will tell you maybe not 50 times in one setting, 50 times when you're in the barbershop, when you're at the doctor's office on a break, right? And so, but if you've had a crunch, a busy week, 
like I had last week, right? You may not have that much time, but to read that text slowly, meditatively, prayerfully, as many times as you have, even if you've preached the sermon before, is a great benefit. At that time, I like to let the, the, the text, what I call, percolate. Before pen hits the paper, to meditate, to listen to what the Spirit is saying, before I pick up a, a, a commentary, to listen to the Spirit in the sacred Word of God. So after that sermon is selected, then begins the exegetical study. Now, this is where I want to talk about my method is akin to Robert Smith's Christocentric method and sort of a hybrid in, uh, of Haddon Robinson's uh, 12, 10 Steps to the Expository Sermon. So we know those 10 steps, select, select the passage, study the passage, uh, determine the exegetical idea of the passage, analyze the exegetical data, and then you want to formulate the homiletical idea of the passage. Following that, you want to determine the sermon's purpose, then decide how to accomplish that purpose, outline the passage, fill in the sermon outline, and then tenth and lastly, uh, prepare the introduction and conclusion. Dr. Smith, uh, which he, it, he has borrowed from Sidney Gradanus, and he will say that he adopted it and uh, he, he not only adopted it, but he adapted it. So this Christocentric outline is selecting the text, review the text in this literary context, outline the structure of the text, interpret the text on its own historical setting, formulate, excuse me, I, there's a typo there, the text theme and goal, understand the message in the context of the canon and redemptive history, formulate the uh, sermon theme and goal, select a suitable sermon form, prepare the sermon outline, write the sermon in oral style. This is very, very um, important. I don't know uh, if you preach from manuscript or if you preach without notes, but what I found in, no matter how comfortable I am, I want to get in the ha habit of writing the manuscript, whether I take it to the pulpit or not. H.B. Charles has uh, written a book entitled On Preaching, where his invaluable wisdom in this step, he says, write yourself clear. Because the pulpit is not the place to be searching for the appropriate word. And so that is ve that's been a blessing to me in my ministry to write myself clear. Dr. Smith says in sermonic form, write it like you're going to say it. It's not a research paper. So indeed, I find this very helpful and I offer it as uh, wisdom, no, no, no matter how long you've been preaching, no matter how comfortable and confident you feel that you are, write yourself clear. So what I want to do is go through just a few things in, um, in um, Joshua chapter 4, just to lay out a quick exegetical foundation, and then we're going to transition to what this means in terms of a social crisis sermon. So the literary context of Joshua 4 is very clear. The book of Joshua is the conclusion of, of most of what has happened to God's servant and the people in the Pentateuch, uh, having a familiar and similar thought in literary style and focus with Deuteronomy. The book of Joshua has been considered by some as a, a part of a hexateuch, not a Pentateuch, but a six-part of the law, thus making it history in terms of genre. So this literary context, outlining the structure of Joshua chapter four, the way I did it is two parts, of course, with um, uh, 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 supporting arguments in that 
the first part of Joshua 4, I divided in, in, it into chapter um, verse 1 and verse 14. And this is the historical setting before the people into the promised land or the historical setting outside the promised land. The remaining, the remainder of that chapter, verses 15 through 24, is the historical setting taking place from the vantage point inside the promised land, okay? In terms of its literary interpretation, Joshua 4 is a retelling of the historical Jordan River crossing event with the addition of the memorializing of the event. Um, the historical interpretation is the memorial in Joshua 4, following the pattern of previous memorials in the Pentateuch that were set as reminders of the faithfulness of God. The, this memorial in Joshua 4, where, Moses, where Joshua tells 12 of the leaders of the tribe to hoist a stone on their shoulder and build a memorial so that, verse 7, when your children ask you in time to come, what, mean, what do these stones mean? You can tell them that the waters of the Jordan were rolled back. The, uh, so this is one. This is the first of seven in the entire book. The theocentric interpretation is God is never left without a witness. He's never left without a witness to his faithfulness and his power, whether he uses stones, his sons, or our stories, his faithfulness and power will always have a witness. So whether I'm using Robert Smith Christocentric method or Haddon Robinson's 10 steps to the expository sermon. If I've preached this message before, uh, uh, steps one in this Christocentric method, steps one through five, that work has been done. But maybe what has not been done and what's fresh, well, let me say this, ver uh, steps one through six have been done. If, so when I did, when I preached this sermon way back in 2014, listen, the structure of the text is not going to change. The exegetical idea is not going to change. Uh, the context of canon and redemptive history, that's not going to change. But if I'm preaching this text to a different audience at a different time and a different occasion, guess what? Uh, the, the sermon theme and the goal may change. Uh, have to be adapted, may have to be refreshed, okay? And so I want to talk, that's, that's going to lead us to this matter of social crisis preaching. So social crisis preaching by definition, Kelly Miller Smith, this is taken from Kelly Miller Smith in his book, Social Crisis Preaching, where he says social crisis preaching is the proclamation of that which is crucially relevant within the context of the Christian gospel in times of social upheaval and stress. Let me say this, social crisis preaching is not the social gospel. It is not adopting the hermeneutics, the worldviews, or the practices, the, the, the ideology of that early um, uh, 20th century, late 19th century movement, the social gospel. It is not that, okay? It is indeed uh, Christian preaching. It's gospel-centered, but it is leveraging the power of the gospel on some of the most pressing issues of our day. Kelly Miller Smith, in his book, Social Crisis Preaching, has seven Point seven elements of a social crisis sermon, pre-proclamation function of the preacher. Uh, that is what the preacher is doing prior to, uh, prior to preaching, prior to proclamation. Is the preacher engaged with the community? Do, is the preacher aware of these particular social crises that are going on in his or her community? That's pre-proclamation. Uh, it can be said that you earn the right to be prophetic when you are pastoral. 
if you are not pastoral, people really don't want to hear you speak truth to power. If, you, if, you, if you're not living among people, loving people, serving people in the church and the community, it's hardly, it's hardly, it's highly unlikely that they're going to take you serious. The content of a social crisis sermon is the Bible, the words used. Kelly Miller Smith says, listen, social crisis preaching is not mere angry rhetoric. It's not just getting passionate and bashing somebody over the head about an issue that you may have personal convictions about, right? It's not mere angry rhetoric. The perceptual powers of focus is keeping the sermon biblical, not, not trailing off, take, tracing these political rabbit trails, but it's, it's concise, purposeful, and focused. The structure of the sermon, Kelly Miller Smith says, listen, uh, the content, the content needs to be organized. If it's going to, if people are going to follow, if you're going to make a difference uh, and be convincing and influential, the sermon, how the sermon is organized and structured matters. The delivery of a social crisis sermon is important. Herschel York, my uh, advisor at uh, Southern, talks about eye communication, not just eye contact. But we communicate with our eyes, whether it's a grimace, whether it's a tear, you know, whether it's a smile. That all has to do with eye communication. And then post-delivery function of the preacher is much like the pre-proclamation function. And, and that is, what are you doing after you preach this social crisis sermon? Because let's be honest, it can be some very sensitive issues. Are you ministering to the congregation? Are you walking through it. Let's take a, a, a horrific event like the George Floyd event that could be very traumatic, 9-11. You know, people in our pews may not have the wherewithal to process that. What does that mean? So it's not like we can just come in and drop the bomb and then go home and watch the Cowboys and come back next Sunday. And now we're off in our preaching series in Joshua, right? This post-delivery function is very, very important. I'm almost out of time. Now, this, this is something the, the Lord gave me because when I'm talking about social crisis preaching, the question that I'm off, often asked is, is social crisis preaching a special kind of preaching or another kind of preaching, or why can't you just preach the gospel? As if preaching the gospel and communicating God's alternative vision for his people is not the gospel. There is no dichotomy here, right? So when we preach the gospel, uh, all preaching has social ramifications, okay? So uh, I'm writing a book now on social crisis preaching with Broadman Holman, and this is some of the material that I will use, and I welcome your feedback is that the social crisis sermon, and I want to tie this into Joshua 4, it's got to be specific. It deals with a specific contemporary social crisis that the preaching text provides God's vision for his people. Sometimes this is the main point of the text. At other times, it's an application or a principle within the text. But too often, we skip around these social crises. We, we, we tiptoe around them. And if that's the case, we, we could have just left it alone, right? But we have to be specific. We have to be clear of what we are dealing with, the issue at hand, whether that's mass incarceration, abortion, uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, police brutality, what racism, whatever it is, Christian nationalism. We have to be clear on that. Now, this is not to suggest that you get in the weeds. You don't need to get in the weeds, right? You don't need to get in the weeds and, and leverage your political conviction. We want to preach the themes of the Bible and, and how that plays out on some of these very, very sensitive contemporary issues. But we want to be very careful about wading, getting down in the dirt and, and pushing these minor uh, I, won't, I won't say irrelevant, but we want to be very careful about getting opinionated 
And certainly we want to avoid pushing a political or even a cultural idea. But we, you want to be specific. Social crisis preaching is obligated to the Bible. The Bible is the main source of the content, requiring exegetical skill. We talked about that. It unifies people. The purpose is to unite people to God's vision for his people and to one another. Neighborly, it seeks to communicate with neighborly compassion. It watches the rhetoric, but it invites listeners to self-denial and cross-bearing. And fifthly, it, uh, it, directs, it's, it is direct in its, in its challenge. James Earl Massey in his book, The Responsible Pulpit, he says Christian preaching, all Christian preaching is confrontational. Kelly Miller Smith says in Social Crisis Preaching that social crisis preaching is preaching for a decision for Christ. So when we are engaged in the world because our maturity, our Christian discipleship is lived out for day to day in some of these social crises, okay? Give me two minutes, Dr. Pascarello, and I'm going to wind it up. Okay. Social crisis preaching addresses specific social crises by naming the crisis. It does not waste time in hinting around with vague generalities that leaves hearers wondering in their understanding and wondering in ministry application. Pastors who engage in social crisis preaching must be specific in articulating how current social issues affect the lives of the communities they are called to serve. The social crisis sermon is obligated to the Bible. It is not the espousal of a political ideology, nor the stating of the opinion of popular culture. Social crisis preaching is the proclamation of the word of God and its relevance on social concerns. Unifying people to God, God's vision for humanity and to experience radical re reconciliation within the body of Christ should be the aim of social crisis preaching. Since faithfulness to the Bible is the top priority of social crisis preaching, neighborly compassion should guide the tone of the rhetoric and the concern of the sermon. Lastly, the effective social crisis sermon must be direct in challenging the congregation, this is the key word, to selfless and sacrificial responses through activism and service to their community. So what I'm doing in a, in a predominantly African-American context, I am challenging my parishioners, predominantly African-American and Democratic voting context, I'm challenging my parishioners to consider, consider how my white our white brothers and sisters uh, are processing information. See, that's selfish. We must never f forget that the Lord calls us to deny ourselves. So there's a difference in between me preaching a sermon that, that only seeks to address a social crisis, but it simply is going to allow my congregation to double down on what makes them comfortable and secure, or challenging them to accept and embrace or at least consider God's vision on that issue. Lastly, uh, so let me just wind this up because um, what I, what I want to do with Joshua 4, Joshua 4, we know it's about the memorial. Since George Floyd's death, murder, uh, that sparked an outrage for the removal of Confederate monuments and symbols of white supremacy and hate uh, all, of, all across the country. In fact, our former president uh, passed, wanted to pass legislation that prevented the removal of former Confederate generals and soldiers from uh, federal uh, army bases, military bases. Uh, for, for me and my community, some of these symbols are very hurtful. They are, they are, they are, they, um, they are dehumanizing, as it were. For some of my white brothers and sisters, there's, all, there's almost a temptation to idolize some of the figures that these statues are named after. Now, in this sermon, 
I did not say we need to take down the statue of Robert E. Lee. No, that's not what I did. I wanted to point to what God was doing in this text and to say that memorials are to remind us about the power of God, not the might of men. Historical narratives are told through signs, symbols, and stories that should accurately communicate God's love for and acts toward his vision for his people. The haunting and potentially humanity-defining memories that result from the constant reminders of man-made memorials are the antithesis of God's vision for his people and are not a reflection of God's love and his vision for his people. These are some, just some biblical things. You know that in the Bible, uh, we are, we are, we are um, encouraged that did not represent the uh, golden calf could be here, that did not represent God's vision for his people and God's love. And so that's how I sought to give some, some biblical commentary on some of the things that the nation was grappling with at the time. And my people, God's people at Plum Grove, are talking about this stuff. And so a 2018 report from the Southern Poverty Law Center found that there are more than 1,700 monuments to the Confederacy still in public places. These are just some headlines. And then, um, then here's my outline, Stones with a Story. So notice here what I do, do. The stones tell the story of God's people, past and present. People who take part in the story, we as living stones. People who tell the story. Who's telling God's activity? Who, who's telling the story of God's activity in the South, in the Southern United States during that time? And why? How are they communicating that to their children? When, they, when their children see these Confederate monuments, what, and they ask, what do these mean? What do these mean? Uh, what, what is the answer? The stones tell the story of God's promises. Who, God who kept his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who's keeping his promises. The stones tell the story of God's presence. He kept his presence through the Ark of the Covenant. Then I'm going to move to the New Testament. God is keeping his presence through his Son and his Spirit. And I'm going to close by saying God sometimes uses stones, but he can use a song. Mahalia Jackson's song, How I Got Over, is how I am closing this sermon. So in this way, I stay biblical, but I also talk about this paradigm in which we can adopt to further discuss the tension and the crisis that was in America at that time, and that was the battle and debate over these Confederate monuments that are very meaningful to some, but hurtful to others, and communicating the fact that memorials remind people of something, but all memorials and mon monuments are not equal. That's it. Thank you.